I'm Lieutenant Candace Marshall Humphrey from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health. I'm excited to join Dr. Marissa Robinson from the Office on Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy and welcome you to today's summit to shine light on the impact of HIV and AIDS on women and girls and to recognize the innovation and critical work that we're all doing to help change the face of HIV. For those of you who may not be familiar, the office, our offices are located in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services and coordinate efforts across HHS on emerging issues. HIV is just one of those issues. Before we move into the presentation, I wanted to share today's agenda. As you can see, we have some dynamic presentations on federal and community efforts to address HIV. And the uniqueness of this particular meeting is that we're bringing National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, National Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day, and National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day into one conversation. So you'll hear some great presentations focusing on all of those um, areas. And so now I will turn things over to Marissa Robinson to talk a little bit about HIV and women and why we're here today. Thanks so much, Candice, and welcome everybody again. Um, the theme this year for Nagad was prevention and testing at every age, care and treatment at every stage. And this theme really re-emphasizes the need to further prevention efforts and to ensure equity in HIV care and treatment. It also reinforces three goals of the National HIV AIDS Strategy that focuses on the prevention of new HIV infections, improving HIV-related health outcomes of people living with HIV, and reducing HIV-related disparities. By working together, we can help eliminate HIV and improve the quality of treatment and care for people currently living with HIV. Next slide, please. So on our screen, you can see a graph that talks about the current diagnoses of new infections um, of HIV among women by the age uh, groups. So currently, via 2020 data, there's about 1.2 million people age 13 and older who are living with HIV in the United States. And during that year, an approximate 30,635 people received a new diagnosis of HIV. In 2019, out of almost 35,000 new diagnoses, women accounted for 18% of those cases. And most of the diagnoses were among women aged 25 to 44 years old. In the US, about 23% of people currently living with HIV and 19% of new HIV diagnoses were women, and one in nine women with HIV are unaware of their diagnosis. I'll kick it back over to Candace. And just to share a few more stats on HIV and women, when we look at HIV diagnosed by transmission category, 84% of those diagnoses were attributed to heterosexual contact. Next slide, please. We definitely want to make sure that as we're talking about um, HIV and AIDS and disparities within the community. We definitely want to make sure that we're including the transgender community, not only in the conversation, but folding them into the efforts that, we're, that we are actually implementing in communities. So I did want to share this slide that does highlight um, CDC data at the end of 2019, which shows um, new diagnosis among transgender. And so um, specifically for transgender women, um, they represented 2% of the new diagnoses at the end of 2019. And as you can see from this slide, um, there are disparities in those diagnoses with more of those diagnoses be being between Black or African American, transgender women, or Hispanic and Latin women. So again, just making sure that we really emphasize the importance of making sure that we include transgender communities in our efforts, um, in our implementation, in our intervention. And as we talk about that full 1.1 million people being diagnosed with HIV in the U.S. at the end of 2019, and that's where we have the most recent data available, we can see that 1% or 12,355 women were pregnant. And we know that together, we can change these statistics. Again, I am very excited about today's webinar and the work that we're doing to change the trajectory of HIV for women and girls. And I will now turn things over to our first set of presenters. Rick, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Candice. Uh, I'm here from the Indian Health Service to speak to you a little bit about some of the data that we have. 
uh, on American Indians and Alaska Natives. So next slide, please. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, and you can, I'm going to be joined today with my uh, colleague, Jennifer Lee, who will speak from more of a clinician's and then a community perspective. But I work with the headquarters office at Indian Health Service, and I run the National HIV, Hepatitis C, and STI program. Together, we think of it as our HIV syndemic approach. Next slide, please. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of our biggest rec recognition days is March 20th. We call it National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day. And we recognize it every year on the first day of spring, the vernal equinox, a time of storytelling for our American Indian Alaska Native and our Native Hawaiian friends. So uh, at this day, we take the time to recognize those who have passed on, who are living with, who are caring for, and who are affected by HIV. So please join us that day in, in thinking about all of our Indigenous brothers and sisters, siblings, aunts and uncles. Um, we'll have uh, some more information coming soon on HIV.gov, specifically to point you towards a couple of videos that we've produced. Next slide, please. So a little bit of an overview on uh, HIV within our indigenous population. Since 2017, there's been a sharp rise in the estimated number of new HIV infections amongst American Indian Alaska Native people. The estimated number increased from about 190 in 2017 to 230 in 2019. That's about a 21% increase. And uh, we do more to reach those living with HIV who are undiagnosed through innovative screening and testing. We need to do more, I'm sorry, we need to do more to reach those who are undiagnosed um, by creating more innovative screening and testing strategies. Next slide, please. Between 2015 and 2019, American Indian Alaskan people saw an increase of 22% in HIV diagnosis. And this graph from CDC will show that they're the only population to see an increase in new diagnoses. It could be a couple of things happening here. We're doing a much better job in screening. We show uh, a, a dramatic increase in the number of people who are getting universal screening for HIV, those people in our clinics that are between 13 and 65 years old. So that could be what's showing that uptick. But we do know that we have um, a lot of new syphilis cases in our American Indian Alaska Native populations. And um, of course, some of those same risk factors contribute to a, a potential rise in new diagnoses of HIV. But other populations who were either saw a stable or a meaningful decrease in new diagnoses, including white and African Americans, they saw a 10 and 9% drop respectively. So we're, we're still looking into our data. Uh, next slide, please. We all deal with stigma. Uh, we see a stigma scale here, and we know that American Indians look a little bit lower on the stigma scale. Um, we seem to think that we have a lot more stigma than that in our communities, but maybe we do such a good job talking about the holistic approach of medicine, uh, engaging the entire person, mind, spirit, body in care. Um, and maybe our communities are just a little bit more open to talking about it. Maybe we've done a good job with our Project ECHO, uh, training our providers how to bring up the subject of HIV. And we've got a, a pretty good cohort of folks funded through the Minority HIV AIDS Fund um, who are doing a lot of work in our communities to get a lot of uh, folks talking about HIV in this related syndemic. Next slide, please. So um, we know that new diagnoses among American people in the U.S. Um, have a lot, a lot of different variances, but we do see, as you can see by this, uh, categories by gender. Uh, most diagnoses were made among gay and bisexual men, but of course we can't talk just about our gay and bisexual men. We have to talk about what's happening with our um, women, our cisgender women, our transgender women especially, and, and look at ways that we can address that. Uh, we know a lot of uh, substance use, a lot of uh, partner violence happens. Uh, we, we do see a big increase, like I mentioned before, in syphilis and other STIs. And a lot of that's um, been reported new diagnoses through um, cases of uh, partner violence. Next slide, please. Uh, we see that 42% of transgender women with a valid HIV test um, are HIV positive. So we gotta make sure that we're really reaching towards our transgender women population too, to look at um, screening programs that reach them and target them where they are uh, in a very respectful way. So we're working really closely with some of our tribal groups around the country and our IHS programs, specifically those of the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board to talk about trans and gender uh, care. And now I'm gonna hand it over to 
Jennifer, who's going to give you a little better perspective on what's happening on the ground in one of our clinics. Go ahead, Jennifer. Next okay. slide, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Lee, and I'm the supervisor of clinical nursing here at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. And um, located in the uh, Phoenix metro area, right in the heart of the city, um, we have uh, the largest um, Indian health um, hospital facility um, in the country. Currently at our HIV centers of excellence, we have over 350 patients um, that we are serving who are living with HIV and um, over hundred patients on HIV prevention or what's known as PrEP. Um, we actually estimate that we have about 300 to 400 patients at PIMC that would be um, eligible for PrEP services. Um, the unique thing about um, our HIV centers of excellence here is that we are a true medical home uh, for our patients, which uh, provide wraparound services um, co-located in one room, uh, team room that includes a physician, our nurse case managers, a pharmacist, benefits coordinator, a psychologist, and a psychiatrist. Um, so we feel that this model um, has, you know, really benefited our patients and um, their ability to lead um, healthy and, and happy lives. Um, our viral load suppression rate um, historically has been, you know, in the 90 percentile. Um, we did see a dip um, in 2021 um, to about 86 percent. And, um, you know, viral, viral load um, suppression rates are obviously a good measure of so many things. But um, since COVID, we have been struggling like many other service providers to reconnect with our patients. And, um, you know, we're always looking for ways in which we can improve in this area. Next slide, please. So when we look at prevention strategies, um, we have, um, of course, our treatment is prevention and U equals U, um, undetectable equals untransmittable is a message given to patients at every visit. Um, and to our PIMC community through signage across campus and continuing education with um, all of our um, Indian Medical Center um, staff here on campus. Um, Opt-out testing. So um, of course, everyone is screened at pregnancy first and third trimesters at PIMC. And all of our impaneled patients on campus who have a primary care provider um, are tested um, every five years um, at PIMC. Uh, we use bundles for STI testing to make sure HIV is included, uh, trying to make it very user friendly for providers to um, pick groups and subsets of um, lab screenings. Um, of course, offering condoms. Um, we reiterate that HIV treatment does not prevent other STIs and providing relevant stats to patients regarding community risk um, is really important since we've been seeing a lot of upticks in uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, um, especially here in the state of um, Arizona. Also um, talking with partners, asking about their status um, and um, you know, the potential for um, less risk um, within those communities. Um, also our NPEP or non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis and um, our PrEP. So um, despite many um, staffing limitations that we've been experiencing here um, at PIMC, we have tried to be um, a bit creative in um, how we offer um, some prevention strategies. So we have taken it um, upon ourselves through our pharmacy department here to, um, you know, offer new prep training programs uh, for our primary care providers, uh, which actually has been surprisingly well received. Um, so we're seeing more of our primary care providers, um, you know, starting patients on prep um, rather than sending them to the prep clinic. Um, and then also a prep training program for our pharmacy residents. Um, and co-steps. So we actually just completed um, a um, training program for a pharmacy resident who will be instituting um, 
uh, prep and bringing that back to White River, Arizona, to the IHS facility there. And we have another resident coming in April. So we're real excited to kind of start utilizing our, um, I, I wouldn't say free labor, but um, our labor that we have here um, that's very willing and capable of, of, of helping in this area. Um, we also um, have called a lot of patients with recent syphilis and gonorrhea diagnosis um, and offered PrEP. It's actually been our number one avenue for getting females on PrEP. So, um, you know, we're hoping to be able to include a review of, um, of chlamydia so that we can actively, you know, um, add those patients to. Um, oh, did we lose connection? it now. Okay, yep, yep, we're good. Next slide. Um, and we can forward through this. I think everyone here um, knows about HIV um, treatment and, um, you know, one pill once a day. Um, it's very manageable. Um, and we can get people suppressed in a relatively short period of time, um, which effectively, um, you know, impacts the community significantly. Next slide. So um, the impacts of COVID-19 on HIV treatment and prevention um, here at our facility, um, you know, we continued, we never stopped seeing patients during um, COVID, but we did um, see a change to about 30% of our visits becoming virtual. Um, and it kind of forced us to think outside of the box in the way in which we deliver care. Um, so there were some, you know, positive things that came from this. Um, it gave us an opportunity to, um, maybe trust our patients a little bit more, give them um, some autonomy with managing their health care. Um, so there, you know, there's a lot that we've learned from that. Um, over 85% of people living with HIV receiving care at PIMC completed their primary vaccination series of COVID um, vaccination, which also gave us the opportunity to offer other vaccines at that time. So we saw a huge uptick in our overall um, vaccination rates uh, for all preventable um, diseases and, and vaccines. Um, our new prep starts continued to expand our prevention by referral. We had really very limited time to um, expand these services, um, but with, you know, extra, sorry, <laughs> there we go, um, with extra, you know, help from um, our partners here, um, we are expanding at a, at a great um capacity. So we had a slight reduced viral suppression rate, less labs, um, you know, visits and, and people coming in for services. So right now we're just really focused on trying to get patients, you know, back on track, getting their labs done, coming in, having some of those face-to-face -face, um, visits and reconnecting. Um, we experienced a, a really enormous impact um, from COVID and uh, the Native Amer uh, American um, um, due to loss of family members. Um, and if you think of multi-generational, um, you know, families living together, um, it, it was quite, um, you know, traumatic for both our patients and for us as providers um, providing care to people. Um, a high impact in our older population living with HIV, um, resulting in you know increased morbidity and mortality prior to the vaccine being made available. So, um, you know we're we're really looking forward to um, you know working more with um, our service partners here. We've had a huge increase in um, interest from our women's clinic um, and through our behavioral health services. So. Um, Thank you very much. Next slide. I think we're, oh, we already talked about that. Hi, Jennifer, one second. Okay, um, I'm like. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Gabriella, the the slides aren't showing up in full screen. It was like the presentation. Okay. Yeah. And I think you need to go forward. Jennifer, let her know when she needs to start. Okay. I think this is the last um, slide okay. here. Um, so Rick, I can speak to this or... Um... Sure, I can take it back real quick. Okay. So uh, thanks so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate that community perspective and what you're doing in the clinic there. Um, you're our star pupil, so it's great. You're our okay. biggest <laughs> clinic in all of IHS. I appreciate it. Um, lastly, we could just talk about something we've done to increase prep navigation in our community public health staff. We've got a series of three or four hour long sessions that people can take online and, and work towards getting a accredited to be a peer navigator for specifically for PrEP. We're also looking at getting people peer certified to be HIV patient navigators, case managers, and then uh, finally working with things like STI and syphilis. So we can find that at ihs.gov. Uh, I think that's the end of our presentation. Go to the next slide, please. But I think we're, I think we're done. Yes. Thank you very much. Nice to speak with you. Thank you all. We're going to pivot over to Amy. And Amy, take it away. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Schachner. I am the communication team lead in HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau. And really, thank you so much for inviting us to participate in today's summit. It's really an honor to be part of this, this group of presenters. Um, so next slide. So just to begin, a little bit of an overview of the HIV, uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration. So HRSA supports more than 90 pro programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically challenged. And HRSA does this through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees. And those include community and faith-based organizations, colleges and universities, hospitals, state and local and tribal governments, and private entities. And every year, HRSA serves more than 10 million people, including people with HIV, pregnant people, mothers and their families, and those who'd otherwise be unable to access quality health care. That's uh, so the next slide. Great. So next, we always really want to begin with sharing the HIV AIDS, HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau mission and vision. And so as you can see here, our vision is optimal HIV care and treatment for all to, uh, to end the HIV epidemic in the U.S. And our mission is to provide leadership and resources to advance HIV care and treatment, to improve health outcomes, and reduce health disparities for people with HIV in their affected communities. And, um, and we had updated our, our both our mission and vision um, not too long ago um, to really be forward-looking and acknowledge the ultimate goal of ending the HIV epidemic in the U.S., and what we as a HIV AIDS Bureau need to do um, to be able to get there while continuing to provide that quality HIV care and treatment um, of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program for those who are currently diagnosed and those who will be, are newly diagnosed with HIV. Uh, next slide. So next, I want to begin with an overview of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. So this is just a quick overview. So our program, for those who may be unfamiliar, our, provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medication, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. And to do this, we fund grants to states and cities, counties, and local community-based organizations to help improve health outcomes and reduce HIV transmission. And in 2021, which is our most recent data year, our program provided services to more than 576,000 people in the U.S., which is, and that's more than half of the people diagnosed with HIV in the United States. And of those people, 89.7% uh, of Ryan White HIV AIDS program clients who received HIV medical care were virally, virally suppressed in 2021. And this exceeds our na the national viral suppression average of 65%. Next slide. So to sort of dive into a little bit of our, our data as it relates to our overall client population, um, we just released our 2021 client level data back on World AIDS Day 2022. Um, and this slide really goes a little more in depth into the characteristics of the clients who are served by our program each year. So in 2021, um, you'll see here, these are this is data for 2021. Um, and for the most part, these numbers have been consistent since 
2010. So for example, as you'll see on the slide, um, nearly three quarters of our client population are from racial and ethnic minority populations, and approximately 60% are living at or below 100% of the federal poverty level. So at, towards the, the, the second box on the left, you'll see that um, while a lot of this data has been consistent for the last 11 years, um, what has continued to increase has actually been um, that the, the aging client population of our program. And so we have served 48% of our clients are aged 50 years and older in 2021. And this proportion of clients age 50 and older has been increasing steadily over the years. And as I just mentioned on the, on the previous slide, um, in 2021, nearly 90% of our client population was virally suppressed. And this means that, you know, they're receiving medical care through the program and they're reaching and maintaining viral suppression, which means that they can't sexually transmit HIV to their partner. And this is really critical as we work to continue to end the HIV epidemic in the U.S. And so just before I jump to the next slide, just really for those who are on today's meeting, thank you so much. We really want to acknowledge the work of our recipients and our stakeholders and our subrecipient organizations who have really continued to, to you know, do all the hard work on the ground um, to really meet the needs of your client. Uh, next slide. So on this slide, you'll see here, so this provides um, our 2021 data as it relates to um, clients who are served by gender. And so in 2021, um, of the 572,000 clients aged 13 years and older who were served by the program reported gender information. And of those clients, 72.3% were male, 25.2% were female, and 2.4% were transgender. And this data includes both the, the United States as well as three territories, which include Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, next slide. And so jumping into our viral suppression data, on this slide, you'll see that the this shows our how viral suppression has increased um, between 2010 and 2021 across the country. And so the slide shows a variation in the viral suppression, with the darker red indicating the lower percentages of viral suppression and lighter shades indicating higher percentage. And so from 2010 through 2021, all states showed an increase in viral suppression. However, some states, particularly in the southeast, the southern United States continued to show room for improvement. Uh, next slide. And so digging a little deeper on viral suppression among our brown and white client population, this slide illustrates um, how significant progress is made um, among the priority populations served by the program, but there's definitely uh, um, health inequities that remain uh, among several populations that we serve. And so in this slide, you'll see it's a side-by-side -side comparison of the viral suppression for each subpopulation in 2010 in the dark blue, and then 2021 in the lighter bluish gray color. And all the way on the left of the graph, you'll see that viral suppression for the Ryan White clients overall in 2010 was 69.5% as indicated in the dark blue bar. And in 2021, the overall viral suppression was, the, was nearly 90% as indicated in the light bluish gray bar. And the data reflects that there's a 20.2 percentage point increase in, in viral suppression between those two years, in, between 2010 and 2021. And it's really great to note that there's an upward trend in viral suppression occurring across all priority populations during this period of time. However, despite this, uh, there's significant progress in viral suppression. You can see here that there, the inequities still remain, especially in particular among Black African American clients, our transgender clients youth aged 13 to 24 years old, and clients who experience unstable housing. Uh, next slide. So in here, we, you know, as we, I mentioned before, more than 25% of the client population that was served by the program are women. And so this slide goes a little deeper into the viral suppression rate among women based on age group. And so in 2021, among women aged 13 years and older who were served by the program, viral suppression varied across age groups, with a notably lower viral suppression rate among those younger age groups. Viral suppression was lowest among women who are aged 13 to 24, which was around 81%, and highest among women aged 65 years and older, which was 95.8%. And the data present here does not include transgender women. Uh, next slide. So turning now you know, to we, I wanted to really take a little bit of time to, to talk about 
HRSA's and HIV AIDS Bureau's efforts in supporting the Ending HIV Epidemic Initiative in the U.S. Next slide. So I'm sure many of you in this meeting, in this uh, summit, have seen this slide before. This is the four pillar slide of the EHE initiative. And so in 2020, just to give a little bit of background, the federal government launched the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative in the U.S., which is an ongoing effort to reduce the number of new HIV infections in the U.S. by 90 percent by 2030. And thanks to the HIV prevention tools such as PrEP and advances in antiretroviral therapy, which is medicine used to treat HIV, um, people who take their medication, HIV medication as prescribed and maintain viral suppression, you know, can live long, healthy lives and can't sexually transmit HIV to a partner, as I mentioned earlier before. And so through the HRSA's Ryan White program and HRSA's fund HIV, HRSA funded health center program, HRSA has had a, a leading role in supporting our federal and working with our federal colleagues in leading the four pillars of this initiative, which are diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. And so on the next slide, I want to discuss a little bit more about HRSA's role in this initiative. The next slide. Thank you. Um, so our most recent, we are, we're currently preparing to release our year four EHE award. So this data that's included on the slide is for our year three awards. And so back in June of 2022, uh, HRSA announced that 60 HIV AIDS Bureau EHE recipients were awarded approximately $115 million um, in year three of the EHE initiative. And so these included um, 39 metropolitan areas and eight states, uh, which are part of Ryan White HIV AIDS program parts A and B jurisdictions. And their role is to implement strategies and interventions to provide core medical and support services to reduce new HIV infections in the US. Also awarded during this time was $4 million to 11 of our Ryan White HIV AIDS program, AIDS Education and Training Center program recipients. And their role is to provide workforce capacity development and technical assistance. And finally, as part of these awards, two organizations received $8 million who are supporting our grant recipients with technical assistance, healthcare, and social system coordination. And so for year three, um, our HAB EHE recipients are implementing evidence-formed practices that focus on those who are not yet diagnosed, those who are diagnosed but not in HIV care, and those who are in HIV care but are not currently virally suppressed. And next slide. And so this slide, this slide really just illustrates the trajectory of our HAB EHE initiative appropriations between the first year of the initiative, which was in FY 2022, and year three of the initiative, which took place in FY 2022. And so most recently, HIV, uh, HHS appropriated $125 million for our EHE effort, which was an increase from 70 million appropriated during the first year of the initiative back in 2020. Uh, next slide. And so what's gone hand in hand with our EHE efforts has been our focus on community engagement. So I wanted to take the next few minutes to really focus on why community engagement is just so important to the Ryan White program and to the work of, of, of collaborating with our federal colleagues. Uh, next slide. Great, so why is community engagement important? So community engagement has really been a part of the Ryan White program since the beginning. And the voices of people with HIV, their communities, and the greater communities that support people with HIV have been the cornerstone of the program since its passage by Congress in 1990. And while the program has successfully provided care, treatment, and support for more than half a million people with HIV, there remain hundreds of thousands of people who have HIV but are not diagnosed or not or inconsistently in care. And so HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau really acknowledges that there's more work that needs to be done to continue engaging people with HIV um, who are not in care and those not virally suppressed. And so as part of the EHE initiative, it really renewed our focus on community engagement to help meet these goals of the initiative. And the program really knows and understands that our collective success really depends on how well communities are involved in the planning, the development, and the implementation of HIV care and treatment strategies. Uh, next slide. So this slide illustrates just how intertwined community engagement is within the Ryan White program. And so the program is broken up into five parts. 
Um, the Ryan White program recipients are funded through parts A, B, C, and D, as well as our um, EHE initiative, the recipients. And all those recipients, they're encouraged um, um, or required to support community engagement that facilitates collaboration with community members, um, works with their community and public health partners to improve health outcomes across the HIV care continuum. And in addition, HRSA Ryan White program continues to invest in programs that support community engagement and build leadership among people with lived experience. And so on the slide, you'll see several examples of some of those programs, including our Building Leaders of Color, our Elevate for All People with HIV, our Escalate program, which is ending stigma through collaboration and lifting all to empowerment. Um, and these are just a few of the programs that focus on community engagement. Um, I'll provide details on two of our most recent initiatives towards ending, towards the end of my presentation. Uh, next slide. So in 2021, uh, the HIV AIDS uh, Bureau developed a community engagement framework um, for our efforts and identified five guiding principles of community engagement. And so as part of our community engagement, our efforts will be intentional, committed, sustainable, flexible, and transformational. And community engagement is included in, from the planning to the development, implementation, through the evaluation phases of any activity. And HRSA really believes that it's you know, dependent on our collective success to meet the goals of the Ryan White program and the EHE initiative are really around engaging people with lived experience in their communities in this process, as I just mentioned. Um, so next slide. And so, you know, with all this talk about community engagement, you know, and our renewed focus, our community engagement efforts at HRSA have really continued to be a critical component as we move forward with the EHE initiative. And from March 2021 through to September 2021, the HIV AIDS Bureau, working in coordination with our health center program and, and CDC, we hosted 16 EHE virtual public health leader and community engagement sessions. And these were really an opportunity to provide a direct line of communication from HRSA to both people with lived experience, healthcare providers, community leaders, and organizations involved in HIV. Um, and really offer an opportunity for participants to give their open and honest feedback around challenges, successes, and barriers to achieving the goals of the EHE initiative. And so as part of these 16 sessions, we had more than 1,900 participants attend one or more session, and they came from really a diverse background of, of groups and organizations, you know, representing a wide range of professional and personal experiences in the field of HIV. And so it included anyone from community-based organizations and nonprofits, you know, federal, state, and health departments, uh, federally qualified health centers, um, and look likes religious organizations, mental and behavioral health organizations, um, people with lived experience, and, and Ryan White and HIV AIDS program grant recipients, subrecipients, as well as clients. And so each of these sessions really offered two opportunities to for the public to provide feedback. And so, as I mentioned, there's a public health leader uh, roundtable session and community member session. And so on this slide here, you know, after we conducted all these sessions, we, we took the beginning of 2022 to really analyze everything that we heard. And what we found was that there were five key themes that came out of these listening sessions. And it's really important to note that, um, that several of these themes, um, this was not the first time that we had heard them. And you'll see the, the cross-cutting themes at the bottom of your screen. And so we, our 2021 sessions built off of in-person sessions that we had prior to the COVID pandemic um, in 2019 and 2020 in the, the region four of the country representing the different states. And so these themes were definitely things that we've continued to hear um, from members of the community. And HRSA Hub, you know, has really continued to develop tools that are needed to provide leadership training to people with HIV um, to help support community engagement activities. You know, our our focus is really to encourage you know, organizations to support hiring of people with HIV, um, to support people from the community to provide services within their community to engage people in care and treatment. And we're continuing to support community engagement activities um, among our national partner organizations. Uh, next slide. And so just, this is just a, a picture. So as a result of the listening session, we also developed an executive summary document um, to share more about what we learned during these listening sessions. And so we encourage you to visit the URL on your screen here, which is on our Ryan White program website, 
um, to, to read the executive summary, um, which we developed, um, to just get to, to know more about what we learned and then how we are using that information. Uh, next slide. And so just a couple more things as I prepare to end my, my presentation. Um, so I wanted to close by discussing two additional initiatives that we're focusing in, on that provide us an opportunity to engage with the community around ending the HIV epidemic. So one of those is the creating HIV awareness and influencing groups to end the HIV epidemic, also what we're calling the change initiative. And this was a created um, to be a more focused strategy to reach our most at-risk populations outlined in the National HIV AIDS Strategy um, and to support the ending the HIV epidemic in the US by year 2030. And so the change initiative prioritizes community engagement as a pathway for building public trust and amplifying HRSA's Ryan White HIV AIDS program, um, both messaging as well as the availability of HIV care and treatment services in communities that are most affected by HIV. And so as we you know, begin to work on this initiative, this initiative will um, first begin to reduce stigma among Black African-American client uh, people in the U.S. through new partnerships, collaborations, and community outreach activities. And so the change initiative is still in its early stages of development. And as we continue to formulate the plans for this initiative, um, we will continue to provide updates to our, our sister agencies and our community um, to make those connections in, in strengthening our relationship and our work within the community. And next slide. So the last item I wanted to mention also is also our, our Black Women in First initiative, which is funded through, it's a four-year initiative funding through the Ryan and White HIV AIDS program, special projects of national significance. And, and also funded through the Minority HIV AIDS Fund. And this initiative supports 12 demonstration sites focused on designing, implementing, and evaluating bundled interventions that when implemented together, produce better health outcomes. And the bundled, the bundled interventions focus on Black women and HIV. And this initiative began in 2020 um, and will go through August of 2024. And so, you know, as you'll see here, we are supporting 12 demonstration sites in states across the country for three years. We're also supporting an evaluation technical assistance provider, um, which is UMass, and, and they will be supporting this initiative. We encourage you to go to our targethiv.org um, website for more information about the Black Women First initiative. And so just in conclusion, you know, in order for us to end the HIV epidemic, we know that we must work together to support community engagement communication and collaboration, partnership and relationships, people with lived experience, and data-informed decision-making. And so, uh, next slide. So I just want to end with, this is if for any information or if you are interested in, in working together with the HIV AIDS Bureau, you know, we, I encourage you to, to please reach out and contact us. Um, we, we'd be happy to speak with you. And last slide. And just for our last slide, you know, we always encourage everyone to connect with HRSA, um, connect with our e-news or also with our Ryan White listserv. Um, and again, thank you so much for inviting HRSA to be part of this today's presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, next, we're going to have Jenny Gaydon from CDC. Next slide, please. All right, Jenny, over to you, ma'am. Thanks so much. Um, thank you again for including uh, CDC in this summit. We're very honored to be here, and I'm very excited to share with you about CDC's Let's Stop HIV Together campaign. Next slide. CDC's Let's Stop HIV Together campaign is the national campaign of the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative and the National HIV AIDS Strategy. The Together campaign is an evidence-based campaign with resources in English and in Spanish, and it aims to empower communities, partners, and healthcare providers to reduce stigma, promote HIV testing, prevention, and treatment. Next slide, please. Our portfolio of resources is divided into two audience groups, community and clinicians. We also have four content areas. Together's anti-stigma component highlights the role that each person can play in stopping HIV stigma and gives a voice to people with HIV, as well as their friends, families, and allies. The testing component is designed to motivate all adults to get tested for HIV, making HIV testing part of everyone's regular routine. 
It encourages people to test however they feel comfortable, including at home, in person locations or by HIV self-test on their own time in their own space. The prevention component includes messaging for all adults about knowing their prevention options, communicating effectively about those options and choosing the ones that are right for them. Together's treatment component focuses on helping people with HIV stay healthy, live long, healthier lives. The campaign shows how people with HIV have been successful in getting in care and staying on treatment to achieve undetectable viral loads, despite challenges they may face, and encourages those around them to provide social support. Next slide, please. This slide shows a variety of our Together community resources. As you will see, we have videos, web banners, brochures, social media assets, and palm cards, in addition to everything else that's listed on this page. If you're interested in any of these resources, on the next slide, you, um, the Let's Stop HIV Together website includes a sort and filter feature which allows you to search for resources by topic, audience, format, or language. You can also search by the type of resource, including palm card, poster, or video. As an example, I typed in women in our search um, section. And on the next side, you'll see all of the resources available to women. I realize the quality of this screenshot is not that great, but it does it is impactful because it shows 90 resources that are available either in web banners, posters, videos that you can use for, for your programs promoting women. And um, you can also use the search feature for any audience that you're looking for. Next slide, please. The Let's Stop HIV Together campaign includes numerous resources specifically designed for healthcare providers and patients. Tools and services range from patient education materials to continuing education programs for primary care providers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, infectious disease specialists, and others. Next slide, please. This is a screenshot of CDC's HIV Nexus website. It's for clinicians and it's a one-stop source for practical and credible information that will help clinicians stay abreast of the latest HIV recommendations and research, diagnose and treat patients as early as possible, and prevent new HIV transmissions. Nexus also contains up-to-date resources for communicating with patients about HIV prevention, screening, and treatment. Next slide, please. If you're looking for content to promote awareness days, we've got you covered. As you will see from this slide, we have graphics and social media posts in the form of toolkits for you to use on your social media accounts. Social media posts in the toolkits are pre-prepared with graphics optimized for social media use and with text that fits in the character limits by site. And um, here we have all the graphics that we have for all the awareness days, but I'm going to specifically talk about the three, one, three awareness days um, we're highlighting during the summit. Next slide, please. If you click on one of the awareness days on that page, these, these are just a sample of the toolkits that come up. Um, you can um, see on these examples that um, you can download the graphics, you can use the social media posts that are included in all of the toolkits. Next slide, please. And then the next three slides that I'm going to show you are the graphics um, in a little bit larger format so that you can see what we've been offering. And this is um, a few of the graphics from the toolkit for Women and Girls Day that um, was last week. The next slide shows National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day, which is coming up next week. And I was very excited to see that Rick showed one of these images in his slides um, a little bit earlier. And then the next slide shows uh, National Youth Awareness Day, which will be coming up in April. And so this shows a few of our graphics that we use for um, this Awareness Day, including the video that's in the middle. Next slide, please. 
And we hope that you will use our resources and um, keep up to date with all of our together information. You can sign up and subscribe to get our email updates by going to the website listed on this page. Um, search for Let's Stop HIV Together in the search box and then enter your email address. The small graphic to the right is an example of a email blast that went out in February for National Black HIV Awareness Day. And this particular email included content and links to the toolkit for that Awareness Day, how to sign up for a webinar that was happening for the Awareness Day, also had some links to a toolkit for gay and bisexual men, and then various links to some other resources that we were offering around that time. So we hope that you will use this feature to keep up to date on all of our resources and information for Awareness Days. And then the last slide just shows um, all of our social media handles. Um, for you to have um, so that you can see the social media posts that we offer and that um, you might be able to use for your audiences as well. And thank you again for including us on this presentation. We're uh, very happy to be here. Thank you so much, Jenny. So I'm going to ask all of our federal presenters to turn their cameras back on and we're going to pivot to the Q&A section. And Cameron is going to facilitate this portion. So Cameron, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say feel free to continue to send questions as we go through these. Um, and if you could be sure to address the speaker when you send in those questions, that would be great. Um, there's a question, I believe, for HRSA. Um, when will the change initiative be announced? And will this involve current direct recipients of the Ryan Wright program? Thank you so much for the question. Um, so the, the initiative was announced on World AIDS Day of 2022. Um, it will be supporting both current and um, current recipients um, will be able to participate. Um, but we're also, you know, the, the what we're hoping to achieve through this initiative is really working with newer organizations as well um, to really be able to um, reach those people with HIV who have not traditionally been engaged in HIV care and to help bring them, you know, share that how care and treatment is accessible and available and bring them into the Ryan White program. Another question is in regards to state level data. They are wondering where they can go to retrieve that information. Yeah, and so um, another great question. So we have our, um, so the slide that I shared showing at a high level, our 2021 uh, client level data report. We that that data within that report is available by state and metropolitan uh, region. So our Part A's and Part B's. I can drop into the chat. I'll drop the link directly to that data report. But we also encourage you to check out our Compass, our Brian White HIV AIDS program Compass dashboard. And so these are interactive data tools um, where you can. Um, um, Take a look at multiple dashboards and break down data by um, by state, by region, and compare from from current year data to previous year data, and then by client population and client characteristics. So I'll drop that link in here as well. So it's a, it's a great way to be able to to break down the data and explore um, what the data looks like in your program, in your state or region. Um, another question in the chat is from a clinician. Uh, she's wondering how she can order free HIV tests for her clinic and mobile clinic units. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of different ways for HIV testing specifically. People can text, uh, go to native test. And I'm going to find that I'm drop it in the box, but I forgot that there's a text that service that we have. It's called native test and they can get a free or a quick test in the mail. We're also right. working on HIV and other STI self-sampling through something called I Want the Kits. So we're developing an indigenous version of that. So free, uh, self-collected, but lab-based testing. Uh, doesn't include syphilis yet, but hopefully that's coming soon, but I'm gonna drop that in the link. But there are a couple different ways that people can get free individual tests. I don't have a way to really send you bulk free test kits, but we have ways that you can tell individuals to request individual free um, self-collection kits. Okay, great. And if folks still have uh, additional questions, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A function and we will be able to send uh, emails out to our speakers. 
for specific follow-up questions, but please be sure to put your contact information as well as the specific speaker you would like to identify. Oh, um, um, it looks like we got one more question. Okay. Um, is there a limit for a number of times an individual can order the self-test and would an organization be able to order it? No, I don't think there's any limit to how many people, how many times an individual can request the kit, um, but I don't have a way right now to send bulk tests. We can work on that though. I've got some funding coming. So I think uh, with help from folks at Marissa's office through the Minority HIV AIDS Fund, I think we've got some ways to, to send uh, some bulk kits out if you're doing like community events and want to have them on the hand. The only the reason we don't do that is because they they don't have a forever shelf life. So we don't like to just load up people with a dozen or 20 or a hundred tests that are going to expire. So we like to send them out upon request, but uh, people can email me. I'll drop my email in. And if we want to look at, um, uh, in, you know, maybe small um, caches of tests, we can work on that. Okay. And the chat is disabled folks. Um, so we will put things in the Q and a section um, to be sent out. And we will also email all of the registrants with the information that was shared today. I, I did want to, I'm sorry, just interject here. In the chat box, there was a question about um, are women taking advantage of PrEP? And if yes, what is helping women to start the process? Um, and I just wanted to, to speak to that um, from what um, it, what we're seeing here is um, we get a lot of referrals through our emergency room. Now we are unique in that we have a hospital facility and then multiple primary care clinics and specialty clinics. Um, but we are hearing this in, um, in Arizona and in our community that a lot of prep referrals for women are, are coming, um, you know, post sexual assault a lot of times. Um, or um, a known exposure or risk. And then um, we're, we're starting to have more conversations with our behavioral health. I mentioned that earlier, uh, partners here and um, through our women's clinic where a lot of people will receive their women's health services. Um, it's, it's really important to um, you know, normalize that as part of the sexual health and history um, questioning uh, when you have patients there um, so that it's not um, always a situation where, um, you know, it's related to a traumatic event, but that it's part of taking a good sexual history from the patient and offering them the preventative services um, that we do for a lot of other uh, women's um, health issues. Thank you so much for all of the presenters for sharing information and really emphasizing the importance of why we need to engage in the community and keep the community in the forefront of the work that we're doing. Um, in HIV prevention, testing, care, and, and reducing stigma.